It's a peach preserved on Super NES Works Guide. The topic of classic game preservation has unusually been at the top of the gaming news cycle quite a bit of late. Typically, this is the sort of topic that only a handful of grumpy old types like myself care about, but with Nintendo strong-arming emulation sites into dropping their links to game ROM files, suddenly it's become a big deal. I couldn't say how many people have taken up arms for their crusade to promote games preservation in earnest, and how many are simply grasping at some sort of ammunition with which to strike back for getting their hands on free games, but the ultimate effect works out to be the same either way. And there is a basic truth to all of it. Without pirates and ROM hoarders saving every game they can get their hands on for illegal distribution, countless games would have been lost to the digital ether over the years. In a perfect world, game publishers and developers would be the ones leading the charge to preserve old games and make them available to enthusiasts. But the reality is that publishers and developers see no value in old games beyond what they can peddle to consumers again and again. So we'll forever see the Sonic the Hedgehogs and Galagas of history regurgitated with varying degrees of fidelity. While even interesting offshoots of major franchises like Mario and Wario are happily discarded. That's what makes something like Shubibin Man Zero great. This is a game that until recently was completely inaccessible to anyone except through emulation and unauthorized distribution. And now here it is on an actual cartridge that runs in actual Super NES hardware, licensed and properly distributed through Japanese retailers. It's a rare and welcome instance of a publisher stepping up to cater to a niche audience in a small but meaningful way. Kaizo Chojin Shubibin Man Zero was never released in the US, and it only barely appeared in Japan back in the day. Though reportedly developed as a cart-based release set for 1994, it never shipped to retail. For whatever reason, it didn't actually make its way to the public until March 1997, and even then only in the most transient and ephemeral form. It was released only as a downloadable title for Nintendo's short-lived Satellaview service. As with most other Satellaview titles, players had a limited window of time in which they could download the game to a flash cartridge for play, and chances are pretty good that most people ended up overwriting their copy of the game in order to free up room once something else came along. Compared to certain other Satellaview releases like Fire Emblem, Shubibin Man Zero is fairly slight in terms of content. It's the kind of game you play a few times, master, and delete in favor of something meatier. So, up until its official 2017 cartridge release, the only way you could play Shubibin Man Zero was to track down one of the few remaining flash carts to contain a copy of the game, or to download a ROM from a piracy site or torrent. Thankfully, that's no longer the case because it's a pretty fun and charming little game. Shubibin Man Zero probably won't go on anyone's all-time favorites list, but it's a solid arcade-style action title. It has nice graphics and music, and fun, fast-paced cooperative play. And outside of brief and ultimately unimportant cutscenes, it requires no Japanese reading skill to enjoy. It's pretty much the essence of perfect 16-bit import title, if you remember the days of poring over sites like Tronics or NCSX in search of fun, interesting, and not especially language-intensive games to buy from Japan. And speaking of NCSX, Shubibin Man Zero actually hails from the very similarly named NCS, aka Nippon Computer Systems. This is, in fact, the fourth entry in the series known to TurboGrafx-16 fans as Shockman. We received only one of those four games here in the States, Kaizo Chonin Shubibin Man 2, which came here as Shockman, but there were in total three games released for PC Engine in Japan. This final chapter, Zero, was the series' one entry to make its way to a Nintendo platform. If you're familiar with Shockman, Shubibin Man Zero will seem familiar, but definitely different enough from the earlier release. That game wore its Mega Man influences proudly on its sleeve, with a blue protagonist and his red-armored comrade who could run and jump at the behest of a friendly white-haired scientist. It was a more linear game than Mega Man, and it lacked the power-up mechanics of Capcom's series, but the influence was unmistakable. Shubibin Man Zero, on the other hand, keeps the overall vibe but goes in a more direct, short-range direction. In fact, that's probably the most striking thing about this game. It's incredibly fast-paced and demands aggressive play. Your protagonists have a ranged attack, but it takes the form of a charged shot that requires you to stand motionless for a couple of seconds while it builds up power. You can't run around with a charged up attack stocked as you could in Shockman, forcing you to use the charge attack as an occasional tactical option. 
Instead, you run around with a pair of boxing gloves or a sword and perform quick combos against foes. This is not a game where you can wait for the bad guys to come to you. In most cases, even the low-tier scrub henchmen have attacks that can reach past your guard. If you wait for a foe to come within range of your punches, you'll experience a nasty surprise as they'll stop just outside of range and take a swipe at you first. This forces you to stay on your toes and close the distance with enemies before they can attack. As such, it's a very speedy game. A complete playthrough takes a little more than just half an hour, especially because there are no checkpoints. You have one life and three continues, and you continue on the exact spot where you're defeated. I wonder about what Shubibi Man Zero never saw retail release because its fast-paced brevity didn't line up with expectations for action games in 1994. It clearly has an arcade mentality about it, continues are even referred to as credits, and it lacks anything like, say, RPG mechanics or an inventory system. It's a great 1987 kind of game that didn't see the light of day until 1997. For perspective, it arrived just two months before Castlevania Symphony of the Night hit PlayStation. This could be why it vanished from circulation for two decades. But despite its brevity, it's a fun, well-made action title, just as you'd expect from NCS and Messiah. The kind of game that seems to be in greater demand now than during the PlayStation era during which it originally debuted. Shubibi Man Zero has a great, responsive feel to the action. Your protagonist, Raita, moves quickly, and there's a surprising amount of weight to his punches despite the zippy pace of the action. And that's also true for the Player 2 character, Azuki, who fights with a sword. You attack by chaining melee attacks into combos, and this demands a small amount of the situational awareness you find in belt-scrolling brawlers. You never want to allow yourself to become surrounded by foes because you'll inevitably take a punch to the back of the head while you're pummeling a target into submission. Fortunately, while landing combination blows does force you to commit, you're never locked down to a single spot for too long. The combos are quick, and Shubibi Man Zero maintains a frenetic pace at all times. It does have a few weaknesses. Anything involving platforming kind of sucks because it's the kind of game that demands almost perfect pixel leaps from the edge of a platform, and each failed jump docks a point from your precious health total. Some of the enemy scenarios are a little on the cheap side too. The third boss encounter in particular involves fighting two transforming vanishing ninja warriors simultaneously, and it's preposterously difficult for a single player to handle alone. On the whole though, there's more than enough to like about Shubibi Man Zero to balance out these minor shortcomings. The game is packed with fun details that give it lots of personality. Your foes, the BB Don Gang, are a group of thieves, and they drop items whenever you take them out. These items take the form of precious objects that vary according to each level, which creates a fun implication. They're looting each area as they go along. And this is a game where your score actually does matter. Once you reach a certain point total, you'll level up and gain a new notch on your health bar. This only happens a couple of times in the course of the game, but it's almost vaguely like an experience system, and it encourages you to take risks to collect valuable goods. The BB Don is led by a ridiculous, nutscracker-looking boss, but his chief lieutenant is a busty, leather-clad, anime cliché lady named Galko, who does a lot of oh ho oh, oh, ho oh, laughing whenever you catch up to her, right as she sicks some kind of giant boss on you. When you finally reach the BB Don's hideout, it turns out to be a huge, high-tech base that also happens to be filled with vanity portraits of Galko. Meanwhile, the bosses you fight have a decidedly silly quality to them as well, from cartoonish mechanical octopi to a spinning clown monster. There are a few of the bosses you can defeat by basically running up to them and mashing the attack button, but others require more complex tactics. The clown boss, which is weirdly called Master, throws bombs and balls at you. You need to use the balls as platforms to jump up and attack the boss itself while dodging the bombs, which makes for a nice test of skill. Even more challenging is Meke, a robotic face that fires off streams of drill missiles at you. Again, here you need to use the missiles as platforms while avoiding their drill tips, which makes for a tough encounter. And then there's Kagemaru, Raita's rival, who shows up multiple times throughout the game to duel with you as a mid-boss. Each encounter with Kagemaru is more difficult than the last, as he adds new tricks to his repertoire every time in his desire to exceed Raita's skills. Shubibi Man Zero starts off pretty easy and becomes quite difficult by the end. I've yet to get past Meke myself, but for the most part it comes by that difficulty fairly in a way that encourages people to come back and try again and again. It's the kind of game that had fallen out of fashion 20 years ago, but it lands better now. So it's great that Extreme and Columbus Circle went to the trouble of lining up the rights to Shubibi Man Zero for a legitimate cartridge release so long after its original debut. This is a fun little nugget of a game that deserves better than to vanish into the digital either. And you know, if more publishers would step out and dig up lost games like this, dismantling of emulation sites wouldn't sting so badly. 
I doubt Shubibi Man Zero is a sign of the future or anything, but it's a nice exception to the rule that no one cares to preserve anything but the biggest names in classic games. So here's to a better, more accessible future.